Good morning. I think we're ready to start. Good morning and welcome to our roundtable on retirement security hosted in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Labor. We would like to thank Kathleen Kennedy Townsend for stepping in to lead the retirement security campaign for President Biden and Secretary Marty Walsh and for bringing this event to Iowa and the Harkin Institute. Many people are surprised when I tell them about the work that I do at the Harkin Institute. That is not an exaggeration, very honest um, uh, comment. And the very frequent comment that they do make is that people do not think about retirement frequently enough. But the truth is, studies show that they're wrong. A 2021 survey of employee wellness by the Employee Benefit Research Institute found that retirement savings is one of the top financial concerns that people report. And in this order, number one is emergency savings, number two is paying basic bills, and number three is retirement savings. And it actually precedes paying down debt. This is how important everyone considers um, their, their retirement savings and their retirement security for their um, daily life. And the number one cause of financial stress is having enough retirement savings. For this reason, um, we have our event today and we're looking at how the system works um, and what are things that are being done or can be done to make the retirement system work better. Social security is vital to millions of retirees, their spouses, and their survivors. Four out of 10 Americans age 65 or older rely for at least 50% of their income on Social Security. And yet, that average monthly check is just a little over $1,500. So we have retirement savings um, in place uh, to supplement that income. However, as we have transitioned from a defined benefit employer retirement savings system to a defined, mostly defined contribution retirement saving system. We have now half of the US labor force not participating in employer retirement savings programs. So in, in the first session today, we will start by talking about the importance of social security and disability insurance and also disability employment initiatives that the federal government has in place. Studies consistently show that a very large majority of Americans are in favor of paying higher taxes in order to strengthen the social security system uh, and make sure that it continues to be available for them and their parents and their children. So we are going to discuss in our first panel what options are currently on the table and what else we need to be considering as part of that conversation. In the second session, our panelists will discuss the well-documented retirement savings challenges, the 50% without access or not eligible for retirement savings programs, um, and also attempts to address these by the states the federal government, um, a new portability initiative, and also lifetime income. For those who have accumulated savings, how do they make decisions about spending down those um, retirement balances? We have a great audience here in person, uh, and then also we have a nationwide audience um, through YouTube, so thank you all for your interest in this event, for being here in person, or for watching us online. This event would not have been possible without our panelists. Thank you all for sharing your insights and expertise with us today. 
And also a huge thank you to all the dedicated Harkin staff for their support in putting this event together. Now I will pass on to Senator Harkin to start panel one. Well, thank you very much, Reina. Thank you very much, Reina Stocheva, who is the director of our retirement security policy at the Harkin Institute. And again, I thank all of you for being here in person. I want to also thank all of those who are online throughout the country uh, on YouTube and various other streaming uh, devices that have gone to different states. So I have no idea just how big an audience there is out there, but I guess we'll find out when we hear back from, uh, uh, from the streaming. Uh, I'm talking about something I don't know anything about, which is streaming. <laughs> But anyway, thank you for being here and uh, this very important topic of retirement security. It's something that I had worked on before I retired. I had many hearings on it. Uh, in fact, later today, I will talk about uh, legislation I introduced before I left the Senate. Uh, what's happened, as you know, is that because of the demise of the defined benefit programs uh, in the United States, uh, a lot of people just are coming up short uh, in the money they need uh, to, to live out their lives. Uh, and so various proposals have been made on how to replace the defined benefit program with something else that uh, is, is secure, uh, something that will provide for a lifetime stream of income uh, in addition to Social Security. And that's why we're starting now with Social Security. Social Security is the bedrock. It is the foundation stone of retirement security in America. And so we're privileged right now in the first part of our panel uh, to have, first of all, the acting commissioner of the Social Security Administration, uh, Dr. Kilolo Kijakazi. Exactly. <laughs> Kijakazi. Yes. Uh, and who's been acting ad, uh, administrator of the Social Security Administration since July of 2021. Uh, Dr. Kijakazi first joined the Social Security Administration as Deputy Commissioner for Retirement and Disability Policy at the start of the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, in this role, she was responsible for planning and managing the development of program policy, policy research, and evaluation uh, programs administered by the Social Security Administration. Uh, I might just add as an aside, uh, I said to Dr. Uh, Kijakazi that uh, with the outcome of that election last night, that perhaps she can give up being acting <laughs> commissioner and be full-time commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, here on my left is uh, uh, Max Richmond. Uh, a longtime friend of mine, he originally comes from Omaha, Nebraska, born and raised right across the Missouri River. Uh, he is the president and CEO of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Uh, this is a, uh, a national committee started by uh, then Congressman James Roosevelt, who was the son of President Roosevelt in 1981, maybe? 1982. And uh, Max joined it in 1989 has been with it ever since, and as I said right now, uh, he is the president and CEO of this national uh, organization. Uh, and uh, uh, I can uh, attest to the fact that they have been very influential uh, in the Hill, on the Hill in Congress, but also nationally in keeping Social Security uh, beneficiaries advised as to legislation, as to what's happening with the trust fund, uh, it's just been a great national organization, and, and I'm sure Max will talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening with, with Social Security and some of the myths that are out there. In fact, I'm going to ask him about that. But first, I'll start with uh, Dr. Kijikazi, and um, let's just start with the fundamentals. Why is Social Security such an important part of our retirement system in America? That's just a broad stroke. You can <laughs> take it from there. Thank you, Senator Harkin. It is a pleasure to be here um, and to join this forum. 
And Social Security is one of the most important sources of income for older people. Um, about 90% of individuals 65 years old and older receive income from Social Security. For many older people, Social Security is their largest source of income. About 40% of individuals who are 65 and older rely on Social Security for 50% or more of their income. And 14% rely on Social Security for 90% and more of their income. For women, these percentages are slightly higher. 42% of women, 65 and older, rely on Social Security for 50% or more of their income, and 15% rely on the program for 90% of their income or more. For the total U.S. population um, of elderly, Social Security is about 30% of the income that they receive. 36% is represented by pensions and 25% earnings. Social Security is designed to provide a floor of protection in retirement income for workers and for their families, but it was never intended to be the sole source of retirement income. We've often heard about the three-legged stool which is made up, in addition to Social Security, of pensions and savings. But the labor market has some barriers, such as discrimination in hiring and in pay, which result in some workers not having access to pensions or employer-sponsored retirement savings plans and not having sufficient earnings to set aside enough in retirement savings. So Social Security helps to compensate for these labor market barriers through the benefit formula. The benefits provided by Social Security are, lar are a larger share of pre-retirement earnings for lower income households than um, for, or lower wage workers than for higher wage workers. Other important aspects of the program are that Social Security retirement benefits last for the remainder of a person's life, mm -hmm. providing longevity protection to people who have long lives. In addition, benefits are inflation protected and are adjusted each year through the cost of living adjustment. And this ensures that benefits maintain their purchasing power over time. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's a, a good rundown on why it's so important. And I just want to repeat for emphasis sake that some over 50, about 50% 50 of the population relies that are over 65 rely upon Social Security for what, the majority of their income? Yes. For the majority. So, yes. And 14%, all of it, basically all their income. Yeah, for 90%. Or for 90% um, yes. of their income. And the other, other important thing, I think, Dr. Kijikasi, is that it lasts a lifetime. It's a lifetime stream of, of income. That's right. The other thing, though, that I hear a lot, I heard when I was in public office and I'd be speaking at high schools and things like that, uh, that younger people, they, they don't think it's going to be there for them, but they think of Social Security only in retirement, of retirement. Mm -hmm. But there's another aspect, and that is survivor and dependent benefits. Can you talk about those and the economic impact of, the, of those benefits? Absolutely. What I often tell um, younger workers is that not only will it be there for you when you retire, it's there for you right now as a source of insurance. So the loss of a family uh, wage earner can be devastating, um, not just emotionally, but also financially. And Social Security helps by providing income for families of eligible workers who die um, and survivors benefits for widows, widowers, and dependents. Survivors' benefits are provided to family members 
um, of insured workers who die um, either before or after retirement. And uh, they are critical um, to the well-being of, of family members. These benefits are particularly important for young families and children. More than one in eight workers who are 20 years old today will die before retirement. One in eight. Social Security currently pays $7.8 billion in monthly benefits to 5.9 million survivors of deceased workers, including $2 billion in monthly benefits to 2 million children. For people receiving Social Security retirement benefits, some members of their families may also qualify uh, to receive benefits. If they qualify, ex-spouses, spouses, or children may receive a monthly payment of up to one half of the worker's retirement benefit amount. So this is on top of what the worker receives. The um, ex-spouse or spouse or child, in addition, receives up to 50% of that amount. While the spouse of a living retiree may receive um, an amount equal to up to half of the retired benef uh, worker's monthly benefit, the surviving spouse can receive up to the full amount, up to 100% of the benefit that was paid to the worker upon their death. Social Security currently pays $2.3 billion in monthly benefits to 2.8 million spouses and children of retired workers. So with over 1 million people having died from COVID since 2020, survivors' benefits have been a crucial um, form of income for surviving children and spouses. And I, I think, Dr. Kizikazi, I always tell and I'll ask Max about that too, and that is, uh, uh, have, ask a young person to go out and buy an insurance policy that would cover something like that. It would not be affordable in the private Pardon? sector. It would not be affordable they in the could private never, sector. Could never afford it. Yeah. That does both. Puts money aside for retirement, yes. but also covers you in case of disability or death. That's right. Survivor's benefits. That's right. It's a great insurance policy. Yes. Well, Max, welcome to the Institute. It's good to see you again, my friend, from many, many years. Um, but... One of the things that we always came up with in Congress, in my, all my years here and working on Social Security, is the myths that seem to pervade Social Security uh, uh, people around the country that the trust fund's broke, it's going broke, it's not going to be there for young people. And this just keeps rolling around all the time. Can you just talk about some of these myths? Well, if, if we had a couple of days here, <laughs> I could go through all of them, but... Uh, I'll mention a few of the uh, most disturbing myths that uh, are really damaging to the program. Social Security is bankrupt. It's broke, right? We hear that a lot, half for years. Social Security money was stolen by the federal government to pay other bills. Uh, the Social Security trust fund isn't real. There's nothing uh, substantial uh, behind the trust fund. Uh, just a bunch of worthless IOUs. Right, we've heard that many times. Yeah, I've heard that. And, and, and that all reliable uh, social security uh, is an entitlement, which it is not. So let me just quickly go through uh, a couple of those. And, and uh, first I wanna thank you and the Harkin Institute for inviting me. Um, I love coming to Des Moines. It's uh, practically home for me. Right. Home is Omaha. Uh, and uh, giving me the chance to talk a little bit about the myths and some of the legislation we're going to be uh, working on in the, in the coming uh, Congress. Uh, the only way Social Security could be broke is if we had 100% unemployment, right? Nobody was paying payroll taxes. That's obviously never going to happen. The program is never going to go broke as long as people are working and people are paying uh, FICA tax. There is a, an issue about long-term solvency. In about a dozen years, there won't be enough money 
coming from payroll taxes and the trust fund uh, to, uh, to fully fund benefits. And I, I think we're going to talk a little, in a few minutes about legislation that would address that shortfall. But having a shortfall, a significant shortfall of about 20%, that's a whole different proposition from the program being broke, being bankrupt. And that's why a lot of younger people, they hear that and think, well, it's not going to be there. It's, it, can't be, it can't be fixed if it's completely bankrupt. So it's important that, to understand what is really involved in securing the long-term solvency. Uh, the Social Security funds uh, were stolen, were misused. I remember years ago there was talk about uh, Social Security was used to pay for the Vietnam War. None of that is true. Uh, and uh, one, one way I've, I've tried to explain uh, uh, the, uh, the trust fund and the important of, importance of the trust fund and paying benefits, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had enormous unemployment. For a couple years, there wasn't enough money coming into the payroll uh, system, payroll tax, to fully pay everybody all their benefits. But everybody got paid. Social Security paid everybody uh, in full, on time. Why? The trust fund was there to fill in that gap. Not only, this is really interesting, not only did everybody get paid uh, in full, even though not enough money was coming in out of payroll taxes, the size of the trust fund actually grew because of the interest paid on these, uh, on these government bonds that are purchased with the excess money. And, and of course, um, uh, President Bush didn't do us any favors, George W. Bush, when it comes to Social Security. Uh, I remember being in our conference room, and I think Scott Fry, your chief of staff, was there with me, uh, when, when uh, uh, President George W. Bush was reelected, we were in our conference room. The day after he was reelected, he came out to the podium and said, I have earned political capital, and I'm going to use it to privatize Social Security. Well, we about fell out of our chairs. We couldn't believe that this was his priority. And then, if you remember, he embarked on uh, a tour of 30 town hall meetings in, in 30 days all over the country. We followed him as best as we could. We didn't have Air Force One, so it was a little more complicated. But we followed him in the media and in person, wherever we could. And, and really, I think one of the most cynical things that he did was, uh, I call it a, a political stunt, where he went to some vault in, in West Virginia and then opened it up. It was supposed to uh, contain Social Security uh, government bonds. And it said, look, there's no cash here. Well, of course there was no cash. I think at that point the trust fund was about $2 trillion. You wouldn't have $2 trillion in cash. <laughs> and I have tried at town hall meetings, and I've done them with Senator Harkin in the past, to explain how excess revenues that come in every year from the payroll tax, how they're invested in government bonds. There's no cash sitting around. And I tell the audiences, I remember one event, I was telling the audience, uh, at that point the trust fund was about $2 trillion, it's more than that now, a little more. Uh, and, and I said, you know, you want this money to earn interest, right? You, you want it to earn a safe, uh, in, a, be a, in, in a safe investment. Treasury bills, not the best interest, but the safest investment. And I said to the audience, you, you wouldn't want to have $2 trillion stuffed under your mattress. And a man in the back said, yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, uh, it is uh, uh, the safest investment. It has provided a benefit for everybody that's eligible, on time, in full. And unfortunately, these myths that I've been talking about have taken hold. You mentioned with the commissioner uh, the benefit uh, for young people, and they do. They have survivor benefits, disability benefits if the wage earner becomes disabled and can't work. But younger people have, I think, bought into many of these myths and are the most cynical about the future of Social Security. And I've seen, I remember years ago, polls that younger wage earners uh, felt that they were more, more likely to see a UFO or to see Bigfoot 
than to ever get a social security check. And that is wrong. History has proven that to be wrong. So finally, uh, why do people perpetuate these myths? Why do politicians and policy, uh, policymakers keep talking about them? And you know, when I'm being polite, I, I say, well, they're misinformed. But in fact, they don't know what they're talking about often. And they do know what they're doing. These myths and perpetuating them undermines uh, the Social Security program. And it's been pretty effectively undermined. And we need to have programs like this to dispel uh, more, to dispel some of those myths. And I think those people that, they, de they never really liked Social Security in the first place. They don't see the value in it even though it has lifted more people out of poverty uh, probably than all federal programs combined. And their philosophy is basically, uh, instead of Social Security, privatize the program, you're on your own, and good luck. And sometimes I'm not, I'm not even sure about the good luck part, <laughs> but you're on your own. So uh, what this, these myths have done, in my opinion, is lay the groundwork for proposals like we've heard from Senator Scott of Florida. He wants to sunset Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. What, sunset, you know, that sounds pretty innocuous. What does that mean? It means we're gonna start, basically it means, if you really think about it, we're gonna start from scratch. We're gonna recreate every five years Social Security. Can you imagine how complicated that would be? One of your, and I'll end with this, one of your colleagues uh, from the House uh, her, her successors have been trying to name a post office after her in California for almost two years, and they've run into the politics, the trade-offs. This is naming a post office. So think about trying to recreate Social Security every five years, how complicated that could be. I'll end with that. Wow. That's a good rundown. <laughs> that, was very, that, was, that was great, Max. I, I just... Again, to perhaps just put an exclamation point on it, in my talks with, when I was in public office about this, I always pointed out, they said, well, you know, you can earn a higher interest rate if it was privatized than you can on treasury notes. Well, yes, however, uh, Social, Security, uh, uh, Social Security funds by law, can only be invested in government securities. Why? Because it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States of America. You can't get that on Wall Street. No. You can't get that on any private investment where it's backed by the full faith and credit of the entire United States. So I used to tell young people, you say, you don't know if Social Security will be there. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe the United States of America as a country will be there when you retire? Yes, well, then Social Security will be there because it's backed by the full faith and credit. Now, if you take that money and put it on Wall Street, hey, you may lose it. It's, and it's not backed by the full faith and credit. And we wouldn't want private investments in Wall Street to be backed by the federal government. <laughs> you wouldn't want that. Leave that private. But for Social Security, backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Uh, and, 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 but I can tell you from experience, in all my years in Congress, Wall Street has been trying to get its hands on that money. They want some of it. They want partial privatization. Trillions of dollars now flowing into Wall Street for investors to just play around with and invest here and there. Hey, and if you lose, are we going to back that by the full faith and credit of the United States? Or are you just going to be out like any other private investor? Well, I think when you think about it, you want something that is safe and secure that you can rely on and know it's going to be there. And that's what Social Security is. Absolutely. Anyway, but you raised these myths and the things that are out there. Um, what are, is there any good legislation? Well, I'm not there anymore. Is there any good legislation that's kind of come forward? Well, you had some good legislation <laughs> when, you, when you were in the Senate. And, uh, yeah. uh, and there is, and I, I forgot to mention one thing. I, talk, I talked a little bit about uh, 
the description of Social Security as an entitlement. It's not. It's an earned benefit. The commissioner has talked about that many times. I've heard her discuss it. You work, you pay your payroll tax, you're buying insurance for when you retire or if you die young for your family or become disabled. It's an earned benefit, very important. Don't get it lumped in with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, an, an entitlement is welfare. And, and people don't wanna be on welfare. And I have, I have never met a social security beneficiary who's ashamed to be on social security. Right, <laughs> and I think I, I I don't think I would meet many uh, social security beneficiaries that would be proud if they were on welfare. We don't want social security to become a welfare program. There is legislation uh, in the Congress. There's a, a bill in the House, Social Security 2100 Act, uh, sponsored by um, a terrific uh, member of the House, John Larson, Connecticut. He has over 200 co-sponsors. Uh, it improves benefits, uh, has a more accurate and, and slightly more generous COLA, improves uh, the minimum benefit, uh, benef improves benefits for the oldest of the old, those over uh, 85, does a lot of uh, very positive things and addresses the solvency, I think in a fair way, by bringing more revenue into the program. Uh, a lot of people don't know there's a cap on wages subject to the payroll tax. It goes up a little bit every year, starting uh, in a couple weeks in 2023, the cap will be a, a little over $160,000 a year. It's gone up from last, this past year was about 147,000. It goes up a little bit every year. The Larson bill would uh, keep the cap at what it is, but start collecting payroll taxes again uh, on wages above $400,000 a year, which is consistent with President Biden's pledge not to increase taxes on anyone earning less than $400,000 a year. That money extends the solvency, uh, in, uh, improves these benefits. We support that. We're, we'd be for getting rid of the cap altogether. Politically, that's probably not possible right now. But, uh, uh, as I said, I mentioned to the senator earlier, I, I used an example once. At, again, I, I do a lot of town hall meetings, as you know, all over the country. Uh, and I, I, I brought up the payroll tax cap. A lot of people don't even know there's a cap because they've never made that much money and they assume you pay Social Security, FICA tax on, your, on all your wages. That's not true. There is a very famous basketball player, and I'm not gonna name him, because I got into trouble once and I did, when I did, but he makes so much money, he reaches that cap. It's $160,000 a year, halfway through the first quarter of the first game of the basketball season. <laughs> the rest of that quarter, the game, the season, the playoffs, the championship, no, no payroll taxes. Why? So I just, bring that as an example of how you can, in a fair way, I think, bring some more revenue into the program, not by cutting benefits, they're, they're pretty meager as it is, not by raising the retirement age, which is a cut in benefits, uh, but in a fair uh, manner, you can extend the solvency of the program. And you said that bill had how many co-sponsors? 203. That's about enough to pass the House. Yeah, hopefully there's still an effort uh, to pass this in the lame duck session here in the next couple of weeks or uh, in the next Congress. It'll get harder next year. I see. Um, we were just talking, uh, Dr. Kijikasi, and I, uh, just, I, I think we've probably got one minute left here. Okay. But um, Max and I were just talking uh, years ago, uh, maybe when I was in high school, well, maybe later, college in some years, I'm talking about the 60s, 70s, maybe into the 80s, the Social Security Administration local offices would send people out to talk to high schools and to high school students about Social Security, about the, uh, dis you know, the death benefits, survivor's benefits, disability benefits, plus the retirement aspect. Uh, we don't do that anymore. And so there's a lot of high school students, they get this idea that it's broke, it's bankrupt, nothing there for me. Can we get the Social Security Administration 
local offices, again, to get re-energized, send people to high schools to talk to them about this. Well, I don't know. I can't. I cannot promise that. But I think it is important to let high school students and and um, the the uh, country more generally um, to let them know more about just as Max was saying um, how the program works, how it's funded, and um, why it's not going to be bankrupt, as as he said. And what we need to let people know is that there are two Social Security trust funds. One is the Old Age and Survivors Insurance Trust Fund, and the other is the Disability Insurance Trust Fund. And currently, the two trust funds combined hold almost $3 trillion in reserves. So even though um, current monthly benefits now exceed current contributions coming into the funds, the reserves are protected um, um, or are projected on a combined basis to um, last and be able to pay all benefits through 2035. And at that point, there will still be sufficient um, income continuing to come in to pay 80% yeah. of scheduled benefits. Mm -hmm. So Congress does need to act to make modifications to ensure that um, we will be able to continue to pay all benefits beyond 2020, uh, 2035. And historically, Congress has always acted, and we believe that it, Congress will act um, to take the steps needed to uh, maintain the long-term solvency of the program. The last time we did that, I was in the House of Representatives. It was 1981. Ronald Reagan had just been elected president, and, uh, and we worked out an agreement to raise the Social Security taxes, which was supported, and I think you mentioned that. Something like, there's been surveys show that 77% of people American people mm -hmm. agree that yeah. that they would pay more taxes to make sure Social Security survived. Yeah. So we did that in 1981 with a conservative president, signed it. That was 1981, and it extended that trust fund. Well, let's see, 81, 91, 01, 11, well, 40, 40 some years now. So again, it's about time to revisit that and do the same thing that we did 40 years ago, and that is to make modest adjustments. And we didn't raise the cap. Now, uh, 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 that needs to be done. Uh, everywhere I go, I hear from people, it's just not fair yeah. that someone who makes $50,000 a year pays into Social Security on every nickel they make. Someone who makes $500,000 a year only pays in, well, let's see, about 20 cents on the dollar of, of into Social Security. It's just not fair. So hopefully we can, we can tackle that. Well, thank you both, and then stay here. Now we're going to move to our next kind of part of this panel now, and uh, we're going to invite, uh, 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 make sure I get my all my people here, uh, Taryn Williams, who's the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor. Taryn, welcome again to the Harkin Institute. You've been here before. And also Judge Robert Pratt. Uh, judge Pratt is a senior district judge for the Southern District of Iowa, and uh, I will just say that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, Judge Pratt uh, had uh, uh, for a long time uh, uh, done Social Security work before he was a judge in private practice. Uh, he represented uh, uh, workers' compensation. Uh, uh, labor unions and Social Security disability cases, and I, I wanted his honor to be here to talk about uh, some of the problems in in when people file for claims and what they have to go through. Um, uh, I just might add that uh, uh, Judge Pratt was uh, nominated by President Clinton, served as Chief Judge from 2006 to 2011, is now on senior status. Karen Williams uh, is the Assistant Secretary, as I said, in the Office of Disability Employment Policy under Secretary Walsh at the 
at the Department of, of Labor. So again, uh, I just wanted to uh, ask, uh, uh, again, I guess, Darren, ask you about disability policy uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the disability insurance program. Can you talk to us about the economic impact and what that means for people on disability? Sure. Well, I'll start by just talking a little bit about the work that we do. Uh, and thank you, Senator Harkin, and to the Harkin Institute for having us here today, and to my colleague Kathleen as well. And I want to acknowledge your decades of championship for disability rights. You continue to be a leader for the disability community, not only in this country, but around the globe. Um, and as you heard, I have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Secretary for Disability Employment Policy. And we have a small agency within the Department of Labor, ODEP, as we call it. And we were established a little more than 20 years ago to bring a particular focus uh, not only within the Department of Labor, but across the federal government and at all levels of government, uh, across systems, programs, and policies with the goal of advancing employment for people with disabilities. And we, in doing this work, uh, concern ourselves not only with the number of jobs that people with disabilities hold, but also the quality of those jobs uh, and the opportunities to have economic security and the ability to earn family sustaining wages. Um, and I know that you know well, Senator, uh, that we have quite a challenge that we continue to confront. I, I think you often refer to it as the unfinished business of the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA itself. We know that in October, the unemployment rate for working age people with disabilities was 8.2% uh, compared to a stunning 3.3% of people without disabilities. In addition, only 38.7% of working age people with disabilities were actually in the labor force compared to 77.1% of their peers without disabilities. And we at ODEP, the, the subject matter experts that we have the privilege of employing, work to close this gap. Uh, we work not only on uh, transition issues and ensuring that young people with disabilities can transition into the workforce, but also in supporting individuals with disabilities in their working years and when they enter retirement. And we do that, we know that earning good wages during the prime working years is essential for secure retirement. It maximizes retirement benefits earned under Social Security, and it increases the ability, uh, as we all know, to participate in retirement savings plans. Um, I'll just say a little bit about some of the work that ODEP does, um, and many of our efforts and our investments are relevant to today's discussion. Uh, but I want to focus on one major initiative uh, designed to help workers with recent disabilities continue to work. Um, and another uh, initiative of ours that helps workers stay on the job. That first initiative uh, that ODEP leads is the Interagency Retain Initiative. And RETAIN stands for Retaining Employment and talent after acquiring an illness or injury network. And RETAIN is developing new service models in five states. We are in Kansas, Kentucky, Minnesota, Vermont, and Ohio. And we're focusing on early intervention. Uh, the first several months after an injury or an illness is acquired. We focus on this uh, because evidence and data show that it is early interventions that may make the difference 
and an individual's ability to retain their employment. Our goal with that project is to coordinate our services, to integrate the medical and employment services that an individual may be receiving. Uh, and I'll also acknowledge that importantly, it includes a rigorous evaluation uh, conducted by the Acting Commissioner's outstanding team uh, with the goal of determining the efficacy of those interventions. One additional uh, piece of our work that I think is important to share is the work that we do on workplace accommodations. Workers are entitled to reasonable accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And often these accommodations can be relatively simple, inexpensive, or at no cost at all. I will note that the best employers are creative and collaborative in working with an employee to determine the accommodations that will allow, allow them to thrive in the workplace. And we at ODEP fund uh, the Job Accommodation Network, or JAN, as it's commonly known. And JAN is a source of free, confidential technical assistance for individuals with disabilities or their employers, for managers, HR professionals, in order to ensure that individuals are getting access to the workplace accommodations and supports that they may need to be successful. And in doing so, our goal, um, again, aligned with what we've been discussing today, is to ensure that people with disabilities are able to thrive in employment, in good quality jobs that give them access to economic security, not only while they're at work, but as they move into their retirement years. I think what, what you just heard is that there's a, a, um, a connectivity between the Department of Labor of course. and ODIP, Office of Disability Employment Policy at Department of Labor, and Social Security mm -hmm. Administration. Uh, a great connectivity there. Uh, uh, both in terms of uh, the benefits, but also ensuring that people with disabilities can continue to work absolutely, and be employed uh, and still continue to uh, uh, pay into the Social Security system for the retirement. So it's a, it's a great connectivity there uh, between the Department of Labor and Social Security Administration. I must say that during my tenure in the Congress, all those years, it waxes and wanes, mm -hmm. <laughs> depending upon the administration, uh, that connectivity. But I think through it all, uh, those of us in Congress uh, worked very hard to keep it alive, to make sure that the people at ODEP um, uh, were there for the, for the, for the good reasons of, of ensuring that people with disabilities both got their benefits but also could continue to work and be employable uh, in the future. So that's, now I wanna shift to Judge Pratt. Uh, I, I remember when you were representing a lot of claimants before you became a judge, that uh, we had talked at that time when I was in the House and Senate about the hurdles uh, and the things that you experienced. So what are, thinking back, to all those years that you represented claimants, what are some of the takeaways that we should know about? Well, first of all, I want to thank the Harkett Institute for inviting me to come. Uh, my roots started actually five blocks from here at the Polk County Legal Aid Society. And Senator Harkin, he was downtown at Polk County Legal Aid when we worked together. We were eventually together. Uh, and so it's a thrill to be back here for me. And if I'm appearing a little nervous, I am. But I, I do better when I'm nervous, actually. Um, and I want to answer your question, Senator. And, and if I go um, you know, to not answering questions, I want you to pull me back. But I think the way you started out with Max and the commissioner is you can't see the disability program separate and apart from the rest of the program. 
In fact, if you go back to the 1935 Committee on Economic Security, they were talking about disability in 1935. It took 21 years to get the bill through. 1960, universality covering more employees happened. And so the other reason that I'm glad to be here is that the senator asked the commissioner about outreach. Studies have shown that people know very little about the Social Security Disability Program. And I've got materials that it's empirical evidence that prove that up. So the first thing is that many people do not know that there's a, a disability component to their FICA tax that they pay each and every pay period. And we're talking about a program that has widespread impact on white collar and blue collar workers. And when I was asked to do this program on retirement security, I want to emphasize one thing before I get to the demographics that you cannot have retirement security without a social security disability insurance program because there's anecdotal and empirical evidence that prove this. In 1990, when the Dis Americans with Dis Disabilities Act was passed, that is probably the beginning of part of uh, one of the uh, points that Max made about when the ADA was passed, people said, well, now we can begin to do away with the Social Security Disability Program because we don't need it. And so if I can make one point when I'm here today, you cannot have retirement security unless you have Social Security Disability Insurance because no matter the medical technology advances we make in the workplace and in the medical community, there are going to be people, we call them worn out workers, that they do blue collar, the hardest kind of work that you can imagine day in and day out. And you're not going to retrain people like that. If you look at these numbers that we've put up here, the disparate impact on lower paid workers, the disparate impact on minority workers um, is evident by, you'll see the majority of people 60 to 64, muscular skeletal workers. Contrary to what people think about Iowa, we're a manufacturing state. If you build tires for 30 years at Firestone, we're not gonna make you a computer programmer, okay? So I was lucky to have a lot of disability, um, uh, social security disability work. Um, I was a legal aid lawyer at legal, it was before there was Legal Services Corporation. We were part of the OEO, Office of Economic Opportunity. And there was no social security bar. People didn't practice social security law. It just wasn't a practical matter. So the way I learned social security disability law was at Polk County Legal Aid. I think I sued every Secretary of Health and Human Services from Casper, Casper Weinberger through whoever the last um, Secretary of Health and Human Services was until in 95 when they made Social Security an independent agency. So the administrative process that Senator Harkin is talking about is there's a five month calendar waiting period. If one shows up at Social Security on February 2nd and says, I'm disabled and they say, we agree, they're not gonna pay you benefits until six months after that, okay? There's a five month calendar waiting period in the statute. There's a bill in the Senate by Senator Casey attempting to eliminate the waiting period. You have to make your application at a local social security office. You can do it online. The first two stages, now this is gonna get, <laughs> I was accused of talking in the weeds. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, the first two stages of the Social Security Disability Insurance process are managed by the states. They contract with Social Security. In Iowa, the disability program, first two stages, it's called initial and reconsideration stages are done by the state of Iowa Disability Insurance. It's in the Jesse Parker building if you drive to the Capitol. 
And so there are numbers that can tell you how many people prevail, that is to say, get paid at that stage uh, of, of the process. The third stage is the ODAR stage. You're entitled to a hearing before an administrative law judge. This administrative law judge stage, it's the largest adjudicative process in the world. It operates, for the most part, as the commissioner can tell you, Senator Harkin, when he was in the Senate, was a big believer and you gotta give Social Security the resources to do the law that you give them. And so he was responsible for increasing the number of ALJs. I remember a number of times discussing this with him. So you gotta have administrative law judges who are merit selection employees uh, administer the program. They, it's a massive program. Um, the last stage is the Appeals Council. If you lose before the administrative law judge, before seeking judicial review, you must ask the Appeals Council in Washington, D.C. to review the decision of the administrative law judge. After you've done that, you can commence a lawsuit against the commissioner of Social Security now. You no longer sue the Commissioner of the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and you file a lawsuit in the district court. It's assigned to a judge. The government defends the agency's final action. The judge makes a decision. This is the, if you look at judicial st statistics from the administrative office of the uh, judicial branch, this is the single most litigated issue in the federal courts. And again, it gets very little publicity. And you can have a review by a district judge, a lowly district judge like myself, and then you go to the Court of Appeals in your uh, regional uh, uh, Court of Appeals, and then you can petition the Supreme Court for a writ of certiorari to have them review the case on the merits. Sorry to take so long. Well, but I think, just hearing this again, one of the things we heard about in our caseload when I was in the Senate House yeah, yeah. Uh, was people were people who became disabled. Uh, their their uh, their doctors, uh, their medical personnel told them they couldn't do this. They had either a, a severe back injury or carpal tunnel tunnel syndrome, things like that, that they couldn't continue to work on that kind of a job. So they filed for disability benefits, but the backlog was so long that it would be yeah. years yes. before there was a jury. How, yeah. So what's the backlog like now? Does anyone here know what the backlog is like? The backlog has grown considerably um, since the pandemic and as a result of years of insufficient funding so that we could do the level of hiring that we have needed. So we have been, I have been making visits <coughs> to um, members of Congress to explain to them the crisis really that we are facing if we don't get the, the funding level, the full funding um, of the president's budget request, 14.8 billion. Um, in FY 2022, we received $850 million less than the president's budget request. For FY 2023, we are um, asking Congress um, to fully fund the president's budget request so that we can do the level of hiring that we need to do in order to um, address the, the backlog, but also to replace the staffing that has been lost over years. Because as a consequence of not being able to hire as people leave, those who are left have workloads that you can imagine are untenable. And then people um, who are very, you know, I've been at Social Security um, since, um, the first day of President Bush's, um, um, his first day in office. I've been there since uh, January 20th of 2021. And what has impressed me the most 
is the absolute dedication of Social Security's employees. They, I would say, um, stay with the agency on average. Um, they've probably been there for like 25 years, but there are people who have been there for 40, 50 years, and that's not unusual. And often it is because as I make site visits and meet these employees, I learn that they are committed to the agency because their families have benefited from the program somewhere along the line and they want to give back. But when um, they are faced with um, such workloads that it you know makes it impossible for any kind of balance in their lives, people are leaving in, in higher numbers. So we need sufficient funding, just as the, the judge said, so that we can replenish our staff and we can reduce the, the backlogs. Because people go to work at SSA because they want to help other people. And so when they see their clients, their customers, not being able to get the service that we would like for them to get. It is, it is as hard on our employees, or nearly as hard on our employees, as it is for the people who we are, are trying to serve. Well, I know our time is running out. We've got to go to our afternoon uh, panel. Any last thing before we break for this afternoon? Uh, and let me just say that uh, we are here under the auspices, basically, of the... U.S. Department of Labor and Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, who is here, uh, and I will have more to say about this when we come back after lunch, but uh, I think this is the 10th state uh, that the Department of Labor has, uh, has uh, provided this kind of a forum. Uh, and uh, so this afternoon... Not as good as this. Pardon? <laughs> well, this afternoon... We'll Nobody has Senator Hardin <laughs> like you, because you have been such a hero. Well, get out of here. That's enough. So, that, get out of here. <laughs> so this afternoon, so this morning was looking at Social Security, this bedrock fund foundation. This afternoon, we're going to look at the private system of retirement and some of the ideas and thoughts that are out there, some of the challenges that we confront in trying to come up with, again, a... Uh, maybe a, a substitute for something that fills in uh, that uh, for the, the demise of the uh, lifetime stream of income that came about through the defined benefit program that has uh, sort of fallen apart in the United States. And there are different ideas, different states out there that have done different things. And so that's what we'll talk about this afternoon uh, is overlaying Social Security with a hopefully some new type of private uh, retirement system uh, for American people to, to fill in for that gap that Social Security doesn't cover. So I'll turn it back to Raina. Thank you all for a wonderful discussion. Uh, we obviously need at least two days, Judge Pratt. Right, for a uh, full discussion. Actually, we are planning to have um, a one day event focused on social security and disability insurance um, in the fall of 2023. So stay, stay tuned for that. I'll plug this in now. Thank you all for attending the first panel, and we'll see you at one o'clock central for the second panel. There is lunch. We're here. <laughs> Streaming will be back at 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock Central Standard Time. Thank you.